everybody. Hi once again. My name is Jay and I'm a record guy and today it's the Beatles. It's been a hard day and night and I've been working like a dog. It's been a hard day. So join me as we talk about the early days of Beatlemania. Oh, don't mind the get up. Basically, uh, it was masterminded by the manager, Brian Epstein, that uh, maybe a more professional, sleek, nice, dapper presentation would be the way for the Beatles and their mop tops to find commercial stardom. And little did they know that his idea would capture the hearts and minds of millions. Please Please Me, released on the 22nd of March, 1963. It's a mixture of pretty good covers and Lennon McCartney material, and that's something we're going to touch on a couple of times in this video, and we'll see why. Let's talk about Please Please Me in terms of its music, because you know what? This is a great album for the music. Please Please Me is an energetic, lively, yet whimsical blend of covers and original material. The key strength to the Beatles' first outing is how smooth the balance is. You might not guess some of these songs are covers if you'd not known prior. Opening on the rip-roaring rocker I saw her standing there, it's funny that the Beatles' most simplistic album has arguably my favourite opening track of any. It's definitely up there with its in-your-face attitude and dirty guitar work. It's one for the books. It's important to keep in mind that this album was quite literally recorded in one day at TMI Studios, excluding material already made up from existing singles. It definitely sounds like it, as the through line of the record is remarkably consistent. The Beatles' original songs on this album are just great. Misery is a lovely second song with some nice early John vocals, followed later by Ask Me Why, one of the more average songs for me. I do like the chorus vocal, but I feel it does ring a little thin compared to other songs, especially the likes of Please Please Me and Love You Do, respectively. While the format is definitely superior, especially in the gorgeous harmonies department, Love Me Do isn't one to sleep on either. The slower pace complements the former perfectly. Fun fact about that, Please Please Me was supposedly at first going to be quite a bit slower, but at the urging of the Beatles' mastermind George Martin, a man we will definitely be talking about in the future, the song's pace was sped up greatly to what we have today. And I think this decision was a great one, because would it really have sounded the same like this? Ugh. Let's not forget Do You Want To Know A Secret, the first vocal contribution from George Harrison on a Beatles penned song. I know, I'll be gushing about his vocals a lot, I can tell. But I actually thought for the longest time that this was John singing. That aside, it's an okay song, a bit plodding and meandering, but it's harmless. The covers, for the most part, are all solid. Anna, Chains, Baby It's You, all solid stuff. But I find it's the originals that are clear standouts here, except for Twist and Shout. What a great closing track, and you can hear John putting his all into those larynx-tearing vocals on this cover from Phil Medley and Burt Russell. Poor guy. Please Please Me. Nothing extraordinary, but an important foundation that springboarded the Fab Four to greater heights. But oh, they still had so far to go. Next up, with the Beatles. After we come from the uninspiring artwork of the first album, we get a much more artistically pleasing aesthetic statement. This one, with the Beatles draped in shadows in their black cardigans, would go on to become one of the most popular and influential album covers of all time. It's another mixture of Lennon McCartney compositions and covers with the first contribution from my favourite Beatle, George Harrison. With the Beatles is a no-nonsense follow-up to Please Please Me, with all of the same bells and whistles, but having the added benefit of being recorded over a much longer period. Released just eight months after its predecessor, it's another evenly distributed mixture of Lennon McCartney material and covers, with the first song credit for George. 
As I said previously, I love this artwork. It really speaks to a much more creatively driven approach to the presentation. A truly remarkable piece of work from Robert Freeman. Along with some of the songs, it espouses a moodier, more sullen vibe, yet this doesn't bring down the energy and life that much of the music still exudes. I think it's a precursor to the exhaustion and frustration that would begin plaguing the band as this strenuous cycle of touring and public appearances would grind at their bones. We start with a whopping five Beatles songs back to back this time around, opening up with the energetic and in your face, it won't be long. In some ways, a very emblematic Beatlemania kind of song. It takes the call and response yeah 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 aspect from She Loves You and diversifies it with a different style. John would later remark that this was the kind of song that opened them up to newer audiences. Then we have All I've Got To Do, one of many love ballads present, but it's not bad by any means. I love John's soft, gentle singing on this one, and as always, the harmonies are on point. Other songs like Hold Me Tight, Little Child and Not A Second Time would follow this lovey-dovey style, albeit with more energy overall, but you can definitely feel the more distinct difference in theme between the originals and the covers. The first real standout of the album has got to be All My Loving, characterising the vitality of the Beatles' explosion perfectly, from the lyricism of All My Loving being sent to you, to those jangly rattling triplets from John's rhythm guitar, to Ringo's always appreciated beat that keeps the whole thing together, it's a great track. Don't Bother Me is George's first songwriting credit, and he takes vocal duties on this one as well. That being said, the song is often overlooked, but I really like it. I love the thick sound it achieves from the double track vocals and reverb drenched guitar work. It's got a very Latin style rhythm to it, and it's one of the earliest examples of a more moody Beatles song. And hey, Ringo got to play with an Arabian bongo on here. That's cool. The covers are all pretty solid as well. Please Mr. Postman, Roll Over Beethoven and Money are all groovy rockers that are well deserving of their regular rotation in the band's live shows at the time, and I think George's vocal performance on the Chuck Berry piece is just stellar. Devil In Her Heart, yet another Harrison-led vocal, is great. This album was really great for George, wasn't it? You really got a hold on me as another standout demonstration of John and Paul's voices blending together so perfectly. It's all good stuff. Oh, but I can't forget Ringo's main takeaway either. I want to be your man. It's... it's fine. John himself would later say that this kind of was a throwaway song. And while I wouldn't go that far myself, I do think it's the outlier all things considered. And that was with the Beatles. You know, I struggle to see why it's one of the more overlooked releases. I think it's chocked full of great material, and while it can feel a little more disjointed in atmosphere than its predecessor and its follower respectively, I think it sits neatly in its place as the sophomore outing that simply kept the Beatles train rolling. But similar to many other great albums, such as the Ramones' Leave Home, it suffers from being sandwiched between a great debut and an even greater third follow-up. It's been a hard Next up we have A Hard Day's Night, the first album to be comprised completely of original material with some pretty great artwork. I love the different expressions each Beatles gets to show off of themselves. Also, a soundtrack to their first movie. Now, uh, it's no secret that by this time Beatlemania had positively exploded and the band were busy non-stop. Let's get into what is often considered the brilliance of Beatlemania. A Hard Day's Night, named by Ringo, released in July of 1964 in the UK and two weeks earlier in America. For the first time, all tracks are original songs by the band and were written by the Lennon-McCartney duo. This was their tried and tested songwriting manifesto, the ultimate show of force for what the band were capable of. And it is awesome. Arguably defining the very definition of pop rock, Hard Day's Night is often regarded as the best and most succinct summation of Beatlemania as a phenomenon. Energetic, lively, buzzing, yet full of heart and whimsical charm. Side One comprises of songs from the soundtrack to the film of the same name, but another crucial aspect of the album which I need to mention, George Harrison's Rickenbacker 12 String. This sound was so influential to the oncoming folk rock explosion, and just another example of how the quiet Beatle was subtly making innovations of his own. This is the album, guys. This is the British Invasion made manifest. 
an explosion that can be understood just from the legendary title track alone, and for how adored the vibrance and life of John and Paul's vocals are on A Hard Day's Night, can we step back and appreciate Ringo's drumming here? Those bongos and cowbell doings and clangs are just so infectious. The song wouldn't be the same without it. And once again, that opening chord is just like a boom. I Should Have Known Better is the follow-up. Opening with a classic harmonica intro, coincidentally the final time they'd ever do this. The middle 16 of the song introduces George's Rickenbacker into the fray, and it wastes no time in making its unique sound known. John's vocals are also great in this one, hitting notes he wasn't as brave to attempt before. I think that's commendable. Next up, If I Fell, the first slower paced love ballad of the album. John and Paul share a microphone for closer, richer harmonies, and an intricate chord progression which shifts from an E-flat minor intro to D major, sprinkling in descending bar chords and a quirky D ninth dominant. It's classic John eccentricities like that that make this one special. Then we have I'm Happy Just to Dance With You. George gets to sing this one, unfortunately as a result of John and Paul handing it off to him for something to do. The rhythm guitar is all over the place, contrasting bizarrely well with George's vocals, and Ringo gets to play with more world percussion, like the African drum. It's an okay song, probably the weakest of side one, but not by much, it's still pretty good. And I Love Her, written largely by Paul McCartney, is a pretty significant song for a few reasons. Regarding it himself as the first ballad he impressed himself with, and being called his first yesterday by John, it definitely lives up to that reputation, being a cut above most early Beatles material for the sheer beauty it exudes. And once again, the quiet Beatle said by McCartney was responsible for the guitar riff. Paul said that it made a stunning difference to the song. It's beautiful, one of my favourite slower songs in the band's early days. Tell Me Why shoots us right back into the do-what madness and hysteria that masks the more cynical subject matter of the material. It's a good one, though a bit overshadowed by the title track I think. Interestingly, it has also only ever been performed once in front of a live audience. A paid live audience. And it was mimed. Oh, and a 13 year old Phil Collins was there. Funny how that works out. Bookending side one, another early Beatles standout, Can't Buy Me Love. Adopting a 12 bar blues structure for the verse, something the band wasn't actually quite familiar with, it certainly has an interesting result. I have to admit, compared to most other songs on side one, it doesn't sound as interesting to me, but Ringo's bashy cymbals keep me invested just enough, and George's guitar solo is more than enough to keep it going. A pretty good closer to the first side. Side 2 opens with any time at all, and the intro is like a slap in the face, but a much less welcoming one than the serene opening chord of the title track. The percussive slam wakes you up and catches your attention. It's got the same feeling as it won't be long in that regard. I really do love how George's Rickenbacker is ringing through on this one, and to give more credit to George Martin on both this and the title track, he had the ingenious idea to have the solo be a duo between himself on piano and the notes echoed by George, which has this beautifully resonant sound that's candy to the ears. I'll Cry Instead is one of John's autobiographical pieces, though not yet as introspective as the album coming up. On this biting folk rock number, John wails his feelings of frustration and lack of freedom, evident in the lyrics, and there is a hint of cynicism to John's vocals I find. I do love the bass break that Paul adds to the third line of each verse. It's quite forecasting of his approach on later songs from the Revolver era. This one's fine, not one I have much to say about. Things We Said Today I have to be honest, after And I Love Her, this one doesn't quite hit the same way for me personally, but I would be dishonest if I didn't praise the complexity of the number. It flirts with jazz and classical influences, shifting between major and minor keys musically, and between first and third persons and future and present tense within the lyrics. I'm a sucker for songs that do this sort of thing. I'll happily consider it and I love her's faithful little brother. When I Get Home, another John piece. It takes your typical rock and roll style and throws a wrench into the mix with more strange chord progressions and styles, something John really enjoyed at this time. Was it because he did anything that sounded good? Who cares? Because it does. This one's okay. 
honestly, nothing special. And I have to say the same for its follow-up, you can't do that. This one's another 12-bar blues-influenced piece, and represents more of John Snyde's cynicism rooting into the lyrics. Feelings of jealousy and paranoia grip the listener. Musically, I think it's fine. I love the harmonies and how aggressive some of John's phrases are, but it's overall just good. The closer, I'll Be Back, is a great little piece. I love the flamenco style the guitars adopt, and it has a more eccentric vibe to it than anything else on the album. It feels like the most forward-looking song on an album all about living and partying in the present. Considering how I feel about the previous couple of songs, I believe fully why George Martin liked opening and closing Beatles albums with the strongest of the bunch. This thoughtful piece is seriously a great closer as the party life fades away into a more ominous final note, possibly foreshadowing what was to come. And that's Hard Day's Night. Guys, what can even be said? This was the first true push forward for the Beatles as songwriters and as a band in their own right. But sadly, this freedom was short-lived, as gruelling schedules, frustration and exhaustion would start taking its toll, and the Beatles started to feel as if they were little more than Beatles for sale. This happened once before, when I came to your door, no reply. Okay, up next we have uh, Beatles for sale. So, um, it should be, it should be, uh, dear, whoo, it should be noted that by this time, they were tired. You can see it in their faces, you can hear it in the music. It's probably why this album is not so fondly regarded today, but personally, I love it. Let's get into why. Beatles for Sale is the first album to lose the veneer of liveliness that defined the early career of the band. Released in December of 1964, work was stressful and frustrating. They just didn't have the time for another streak of all original work, nor work that was all happy and poppy, so as such, they had to return to some covers. This has marred the reputation of the album over the years, but I want to make a stance and defend this album, because overall, I think it's great. For a start, this album was a boon for studio experimentation, playing with fade-ins, guitar feedback, and quirky percussive instrumentation like the timpani, African hand drums, and god I hope I'm saying this right, the Chacalho? The Chacalho? Whatever. It also reflects the Beatles' growing interest in Bob Dylan after meeting him in New York in August of 1964. The album opens with two back-to-back -back autobiographical pieces from John, No Reply and I'm a Loser. Of the former, I have to say this is one of the best opening tracks on a Beatles song. The harmonies are just angelic. John's voice sounds fuller and more introspective than ever, and the instrumentation feels angrier, louder, less joyful. It tells the story of a young man failing to connect with an unfaithful girlfriend, yet knowing she's home. Like the previous album, George Martin's piano part thickens the sound alongside the acoustic guitars, and the midsection to this song is just heavenly. I'm a Loser is another Dylan-esque number, one of John's personal responses to fame and frustration, and once again the harmonies in this are just incredible. I've always found the combined vocals before this to be good, but something about the harmony work on this album is just a whole other level. Babies in Black is a waltzy, bluesy number that continues the downtrodden themes of the previous two songs. This is actually an early example of George Martin's creative direction being objected to, as despite his thoughts, the band kept George's twangy guitar introduction. And honestly, power to it. Our first cover is rock and roll music, and as always, the Beatles do a fine job covering Chuck Berry. This is another great demonstration of John's raspier rock leads, but other than that, it's just fine. Nothing special to talk about. Next up, I'll Follow the Sun. This is a song I've wanted to talk about for a while now, because it's another great candidate, at least to me, for Paul's first Yesterday. Reworked from an old song Paul created when he was 16, it definitely has a more innocent, positive vibe compared to the previous songs. I think it's a great change of pace. The gorgeous sliding guitar leads beautifully complement Paul's vocals, and the lyricism is just on point. It's great. Oh boy, now we come to one of the often considered low points of the album, the Roy Lee Johnson cover, Mr. Moonlight. The Hammond organ seems to be what puts people off about this one, and I get it, 
kind of. It's kind of dreary and dull, but I don't mind it per se. I think the vocals are fun, and I really have to highlight how great the intro is from John. It's powerful. Side 1 closes with Kansas City, another cover. This one's okay. It's my least favourite song on the album, just doesn't do much for me. Paul's vocals are fine, but it's just kind of there. Now side 2, oh boy, it opens with a bang. The original song, 8 Days A Week. This one is just incredible. The first pop song to open with a fade in recording, it's a more upbeat romantic experience with a catchy hook and happy vibes. The harmonies, once again, angelic and rich. And it's right up there with the likes of I Wanna Hold Your Hand and She Loves You in my book. Two covers follow up, the former is Buddy Holly's Words of Love, a nice softer number with pretty harmonies, a mixture of John, George and Paul all harmonising to perfection, whilst George's double track guitar drives the lovely number along. Then we have Honey Don't, Ringo's sole lead vocal contribution. Not much to say to be honest, Ringo's vocals are fine, though I think it's one of his lessers for me. But I do like the staccato sound George gets from his guitar in the leads. We then come to another original, Every Little Thing. This one's just beautiful. The beauty of this album's harmonies reach a high point here. This song is thought to be a loving tribute to then girlfriend Jane Asher, but regardless of its origins, it's still amazing. Ringo gets to play with timpani over the choruses, throwing in some flourishes over the refrain. It's a great piece and John's double track vocals really bring a wide, rich sound. I don't want to spoil the party. This one's similar to I'm a Loser in the sense that it's upbeat but conceals a more melancholy message. It tells the story of a partygoer who is stood up by their partner but leaves rather than spoiling the party for everyone. It's a funky little country style number. It's fine. The penultimate number is What You're Doing. I think this one's okay, but I understand why Paul later looked unkindly on it, as I will be fair, it's a bit dreary. But I do want to say that his vocals on this one are pretty good. I like the reaches he makes on some of the lines and I think it's whimsical. We then close, unfortunately, with a cover. And it's one of the weaker ones, I think. Everybody's trying to be my baby, George's sole lead vocal contribution, which gets tacked on to the end. And I can't help but feel it's an afterthought. It just kind of feels by the books. Beatles for Sale. It's a bit of an uneven album, granted, but I really love the original material and I think that's what makes this album special. It's the start of the experimentation, the maturing of their sound, the deepening of the lyrical themes, and it would all start coming together. All they needed was a little help. <laughs> Another movie paired album released 6th of August 1965. This album is so important. If the first four were the ultimate rise of Beatlemania, Help was the first true push to be regarded not just as pop rock boys, but as true artists in their own right. Featuring some of the band's biggest hits yet, like Yesterday, Help, and Ticket to Ride, we've got a whole lot to cover. The deepening of the Beatles songwriting that flourished on Beatles for Sale really starts coming to its own here, and the studio experimentation also takes many new directions, especially in regards to multi-tracking. The title track is just a vibe. It's a rollicking up-tempo rocker which, to John's dismay, was not the slower paced style he initially intended. It's a genuine cry for, well, help, being in what John would describe as his fat Elvis period. The first nine takes alone concentrated on the instrumental backing to the song, and this marks the first instance of the band using two four-track machines to achieve a bouncing effect. It's a great number, one of their standouts. Next up is The Night Before, the first Beatles song to include an electric piano played by John. Reception on this song in later years is rather mixed, and I have to admit I'm in the middle. I think it's fun, and the echoey vocals are great, but it is kind of just average considering some of the other juggernauts side one has to offer, such as... Hey! John steps once more into his Bob Dylan mindset with the folky, provocative number, You've Got to Hide Your Love Away. I just adore this one. It's one of my favourite songs John has ever sung. It's so heartfelt and deep. Fun fact, it was supposedly a former Quarrymen bandmate, Pete Shotton, who suggested adding the hey to the refrain. And you know what? Thanks, Pete because that's probably the best part of the song. Now we come to a song written and sung by George, I Need You. And oh 
gosh, for the first song to be written by him in three albums time, the growth is just impeccable, despite the band's dislike for what he'd attempted prior. His vocals on this song are just beautiful, and I love the guitar cadences fading through by way of a volume pedal and the suspended chords. It's a very ethereal style, and it's just sublime. Next song is Another Girl. This one's bouncy and lively, kind of in the style of She's a Woman from previous sessions, and backed by block vocal harmonies. It's a very wide sound. I think it's okay, not too special compared to the rest of Side One, but I do enjoy the flourishes here. Coming on to You're Going to Lose That Girl. Another beauty. The harmonies in the start are just lovely. It's another fine piece, sadly a little overshadowed by what follows, but it's a good one, I don't have much to say. And of course, that following song is Ticket to Ride. It expands the typical AABA pop format with eight bars of the verse and chorus forming the A section and the main bridge having nine bars as part of the B section. The underlying A chord that suspends throughout the verse has a very Indian style droning effect. It's quite Raga style. And on an overall scale, the song is just heavier, bigger than what they'd done before. Once more, George's Rickenbacker carries the sound to the heavens. Side 2 opens on a fun little cover sung by Ringo, Act Naturally. It's oddly fitting with the theme as Ringo has a jolly sing-along about acting sad and lonely as part of a film. It would actually be the last cover the band recorded until Let It Be years later, though one more will follow soon. It's okay, one of Ringo's more lively vocal contributions. Next up, it's Only Love. This one is just serene. This is another song where the experimental approach to song production diversifies the sound, with the use of heavy tremolo on one of George's leads and using capos on the guitars to form the higher register. I'll admit, the lyrics are a little sparse in comparison, but overall, it's alright. We then have George's second song, You Like Me Too Much. While I consider I need you to be far stronger, this one is also pretty nice. It drifts between blues and pop rock motifs and features an interesting combination of a normal piano played on separate ends by Paul and George Martin and a Hona Pianet electric piano played by John. It's alright, but like I said, I Need You is just a lot better. Tell me what you see. This one is so fun. An upbeat, folky number, it's very indicative of what would follow on the next album. The second verse is inspired by a religious motto that was hung on the wall in the home of John's aunt, Mimi Smith. Ringo gets to frolic around with claves and maracas on this one, and George plays with a guiro, a Latin American percussive instrument. A good song, all in all. I've just seen a face. I adore the intro to this one. It's beautiful, and the song explodes into this upbeat blend of folk, bluegrass, and pop. There's not even any bass on this one, just acoustics, a brushed snare, and maracas. With so little low end, you'd think it might feel a bit thin, but instead, I think it just makes it that much more energetic and rich. And I have to commend just how well Paul pulls off the vocals in this one. The pace at which he sings is really tough to follow along with in one take. It must have been brutal. The vocals alone make this a very unique Beatles song. And finally, we have Yesterday. What even needs to be said about this utter juggernaut? The most covered song of all time. The first song to feature only one of the Beatles plus a string quartet. It's just beautiful, masking what might be seen as schmaltzy lyrical content with a much more subdued, almost eerie string backing. It's groany and melancholy, and it bookends the album perfectly, ending us on such a sombre, provocative, thoughtful final note. Just kidding, it's Dizzy Miss Lizzy. I don't know what was going on with the track listing here, guys. I don't mind it, okay? It, it's a fun cover, emblematic of the early Beatles style, but putting a cover like this at the end of this much more matured, critically acclaimed album feels so out of left field. It's such a mood killer. After the beautiful ending of Yesterday, it feels like it totally kneecaps the atmosphere that the album could have ended on. I'm sure it has its fans, I'm just not one of them. And that was Help. By far the band's biggest step forward yet, their declaration of their status as true artists in the field, one that brought the eyes of much more critical reception, and how good that it did, because what came next, no one was ready for.
finally back in my element and you know what so were the Beatles with their next masterpiece rub did anyone smell Bob Dylan Rubber Soul is the first album that shifted the Beatles from the dominating pop rock foursome to musical geniuses pioneering the very evolution of popular music as well as the way albums were recorded and regarded Derived from the phrase plastic soul, the name is a means for the Beatles to express their confessed lack of authenticity compared to the African American artists they were inspired by. Considering the Beatles were also often in hot water for refusing to play segregated shows in a decade where civil rights would explode amidst a volatile social landscape, I really respect this notion of owing such tribute to the people who really defined rock and roll. Rubber Soul was the first album free from the constraints of constant touring and public showing, but still had the unenviable deadline of just four weeks recording. Despite this, the Beatles made the studio their instrument, incorporating more exotic instrumentation and taking more direct control of their artistic vision. Drive My Car opens the album. It's a great upbeat number. It's like a fine blend of an early Beatles rocker with the more matured nuances that define their mid years. Just from this song alone, you had the feeling that this record was going to be different. And how different it was. When Norwegian Wood marked the second appearance of a sitar on a western rock recording, beaten just barely by See My Friends from the Kinks, it became an influential piece to the development of raga rock and psychedelic rock respectively. It also exposed listeners to the stylings of Indian classical and was vital to the evolution of world music. This song, to put it simply, is beautiful and was the first time the Beatles truly ascended beyond what they had been prior. You Won't See Me, a song by Paul regarding his troubled relationship with Jane Asher. It's another great piece. One of the final songs recorded close to the deadline, it definitely feels like a song born from exhaustion, as the tempo gradually slows throughout, dragged along by Paul's Motown-inspired bassline. Oh boy, nowhere man. Another absolutely stellar piece of music. The opening a cappella harmonies are some of the best the Beatles had done up to that point, and like the song before it, was recorded near the end of production and exudes a sensation of fatigue and insecurity. It's gorgeous, and this has to be one of George's most beautiful guitar solos to date. Next up, Think For Yourself. We get a groovy slice of experimentation here, as Paul makes use of a fuzz bass for the lead guitar line, the first time a bass had been recorded with a fuzz box device. It really shows because the sound is so bizarrely unique for its time. Oh, and George Steele's lead vocals here, and it's great! Rubber Soul was the time that, thanks to influences like Bob Dylan and hallucinogenic drugs, George began experiencing his own personal enlightenment of sorts, starting to grow weary and critical of the fame the Beatles had achieved, thinking it pointless. Following on, we have The Word. It's an okay one. I think it's the filler piece on side one for the most part, although Ringo really shines on this one. It's altogether average amongst a pile of gold, so nothing too bad. Ending side one, we have Michelle. I'll admit, I'm a little mixed on this one, although I recognise why it's so widely regarded. It's classic Paul Cheese, going between English and French lyrics that espouse schmaltzy romance, but the finger-picking style acoustic is a nice listen. It's another example of a more exotic sound, taking inspiration from more French-style blues, but considering how lively much of the album can be while still being introspective and intelligent, this one does sit a little deadbeat to me. Side 2 opens on what goes on, Ringo's sole lead vocal contribution, and I think this one, while overlooked, is really fun. Ringo has always been fond of the country style, and this rockabilly piece is totally his field. It's enjoyable and definitely one of the simple songs on the album, but I don't even mind that. It keeps that early Beatles spirit that's often appreciated. Next up, Girl. What could be called John's version of Michelle, I suppose? This was the last song finished for the album, and it's absolutely melancholic and downpaced. It's easily the most sluggish feeling of the album, and I have to admit, the harmonies on this one don't capture me as much as Beatles songs usually do. They feel a bit... bland to me, I guess. I'm looking through you, another beauty, and another Paul song lamenting about his partner. But the vocal work here feels like some of the most genuine and pained he's ever been, as the narrator laments on their refusal to see the change in their partner. It's quiet, more traditional pop rock in style, it's gorgeous. But nothing 
could prepare me for the first listen of In My Life. If yesterday was Paul's first song that proved his songwriting had matured far beyond the stylings of a young, inexperienced Liverpudlian, In My Life is John's turn. Written about the earnest innocence of his childhood, it's also very nostalgic and heartwarming with a beautiful hook. It features one of the most infamous George Martin factoids. The song supposedly influenced the later use of harpsichords in pop music, yet the solo was actually just done on piano with the track recording at half speed, then sped up to create the harpsichord style sound. Little tidbits like that I love because it showed that even as they grew as musicians, George Martin always had some key hands to play as the fifth Beatle. We then come to Wait, a Help era song, which was rejected for the same album. It definitely feels more in that style, but I enjoy it all the same, especially as it revisits George's volume pedal work from I Need You. It's sorrowful and bright all at once, but I can see why it's a little overlooked. If I Needed Someone, George's next song also on lead vocals, and wouldn't you know it, it's one of the album's best. Written for Patty Boyd, whom George took a big interest in at the time, it brings George's jangly guitar riff to the centre stage, playing around with drone and mixolydian harmonies that emphasise George's growing interest in Indian classical music. It's a great response to influence from the birds, who in return took influence from A Hard Day's Night. This one's gorgeous, and George was far from done proving his own abilities in the near future. We then end on Run For Your Life. Let's put the elephant aside, alright? The subject matter, already criticised and torn apart by many a critic in years since, is what it is. John himself later looked back unkindly on it, and yeah, it's not exactly pleasant, especially given the album that it's part of. That aside, musically, it's just okay too. It's rock and roll style with the typical three-part harmonies you've come to expect, but the bluesy solo is one of the less inventive moments on Rubber Soul. It feels more like it's John than George playing it. Overall, a rather weak final note. But still, Rubber Soul is regardless absolutely ginormous, a monumentous achievement that not only heralded the Beatles' success at establishing themselves as true artists, but in shaping the very way popular music would grow and develop. The album was now the dominant format, and artists all over began pining to create their own Rubber Soul. But don't you worry, because as 1966 dawned, the Beatles were still going to go in, guns blazing. Alright guys, that'll be it for now. We're going to continue from Revolver to the rest of the Beatles discography next time in part two. It would just be too much for the kind of video that I want to make to do it all in one go. If you want a full, expansive, deep discog dive of the Beatles entire catalogue in long form content, check out Mike the Snare's video linked in the video description below. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time, and as always, keep spinning.